Hey guys, my name is Ryan O'Malley with The Weekender and I'm here on a beautiful Wednesday at one of my favorite venues, Penn's Peak and Jim Thorpe sitting here with two of the guys from tonight's headliner, Dark Star Orchestra, Rob Baracco and Rob Corris. How are you guys doing tonight? Fine, thank you. How are you doing well? And of course I've got to start with this, seven years now, doing the New Year, or doing the pre-Thanksgiving show up here. It's, uh, How's it been for you guys? It's a great one. I mean, we love we love coming here any time of year. I mean, Penn's Peak is probably one of our five favorite venues in the country, without a doubt. Um, and you know, the the night before Thanksgiving works. You know, we 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 fill it up. Everybody has a great time. It's 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 as much of a tradition for us as it is for the fans. And they obviously love coming here because they pack this joint every time. So. And the energy gets better and better each year, it seems like, so. Yeah, the crowd's going to be bigger this year than last year, and last year's was really big, so it's uh, we might come close to a sellout tonight. Nice, nice. Now, I, I did want to mention one thing about Penn's Peak. I know, I think it was maybe three years ago, I interviewed Dino, and he mentioned about you guys trying to put together a festival, which obviously happened this past year, but I know three years ago he was mentioning the name Penn's Peak. Was there any kind of work with that? It was, we talked about it. Um, when it came time for us to decide where to do a festival, Penn's Peak was on a short list. Uh, camping wasn't going to be as easy as we wanted it to be. Uh, so it, it, it seemed like a good idea. It is a good idea, but uh, logistically the facilities weren't there for us to make it happen. So we moved it. We're doing it in Ohio. Uh, we did it last Labor Day weekend. It's called the Dark Star Jubilee. Uh, we ended last year's festival season with it, and this year we're going to open the festival season with it and have it again in the same place, Buckeye Lake, uh, Memorial Day weekend. With the hope that no hurricane comes wailing through like it did oh, last time. Yeah. <laughs> well, that sort of leads me to my next question. I was going to ask you, other than the hurricane, how was the first festival for you guys? <laughs> <laughs> other than the weather, it was fantastic. It was off to a great, great start. Yeah, and it really was. The we had a, we had a, for, for a hurricane, we had an amazing walk-up. And the people that came just, you know, they bucked up and they had a wonderful time. And uh, we had some logistical problems. We lost our main stage. The footing on the main stage actually gave way. So it was unsafe. So we moved everything onto the smaller stage. All the acts cooperated and it turned out to be a beautiful experience for everybody. Nice. Albeit a wet one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now uh, I'm going back to the headlining shows. Now I did want to ask, since the festival and everything, what have the set list been like for you guys? Has there been like newer material that's been introduced, like newer time frames to be playing? Well, the last the last couple of years, ever since Jeff Matson came on board, we've started to delve back into the um, uh, the pig pen era, which the band never did before, really. Um, we we would do a couple of tunes in an elective set list where we'd make up a set list, maybe, maybe one or two tunes. But once we started doing the uh, you know the Europe '72 stuff and then pre Europe, there's a lot of pig pen material. And then you go you know we started to delve back into the '69 period, which was uh, just a whole different band, really. You know, two drummers, uh, Tom Constantin on keyboards, you know, and Pig singing, you know, all that stuff too. Uh, so we've been we've been going back, and uh, the band really gets it now. You know, we're 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 able to go back to those eras now as well as we can go back to any era, and the fans love it, man. And because obviously, most of them have never never saw any of that stuff. You know, except the really older heads. You know, so. yeah, guys like Baraka. I didn't even see that. That was way before my time. Sorry, you're it was upset way before your time. Yeah, it was a little before a little your time. Little before my time. No, I saw my first Dead show was actually the last show in New York before they went to Europe for the '72 tour. So I got to see Pigpen once, but that was it, you know. Yeah, uh, Rob, your first show? The first show I went to? Dead show. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm a little bit younger, so um, <laughs> my senior year in high school, uh, April 11th, 1987. Oh, nice. Uh, Chicago. Nice. And it was, yeah, it was a great time. It was, you know, <laughs> got, got hooked. Okay. It's the hook sank deep, obviously. Yeah, really. Same here, my first dead show. I mean, from the from the opening notes, it was like, I knew it was, there was no return. For me, it was, you know, the first tape, just like a week before that show, I got turned on to the dead, hearing a tape of some other show that ended with Not Fade Away, and the band left the stage and the crowd kept going. Yeah. And then the band came back and picked it up and I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. And then my first show, they did that. 
and that was it. That's awesome. Welcome. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> now, um, I don't know, going back about the uh, delving back into the earlier days of Dead with you guys, I wanted to ask Rob, for you, being in the band for like so many years now, how has the changeover been since the old lineup versus a new one and diving back into that older kind of stuff? Well, you know, I mean, it's been great. But, you know, over the years, I've been in the band since 1999, and there's there's been quite a few different lineups. Mm -hmm. You know, when I joined, Kevin, who's our bass player now, he was the original bass player, but he wasn't in the band at that time, and then he came back. You know, so there's been a lot of different lineups over the years, some that were short-lived, and some that lasted a very long time. Um, having said that, the lineup we have now, you know, af after Scott died, when Rob came on, um, that was a tough period, and it took a while to adjust to, to Rob's playing, and for Rob to adjust to us as Big well. Big time. Um, you know, I know it, it did a lot, you know, he noticed a lot of things in his playing that changed for him. And then, you know, it was pretty solid until Jeff came in, after John left. And again, it took us a while to find what Jeff's voice was and what, and for Jeff to find how our voice was and how we, how we operated musically. Uh, once we started figuring that out, we got to delve back into the 60s stuff that we'd never touched before. And to be honest, I hadn't even listened to a lot of it as a deadhead because the access I had to it wasn't great recordings, and it wasn't a lot of stuff, you know, it was a lot of feedback and a lot of jamming and psychedelia that I wasn't really listening to as much. So it was a whole new thing for me, and I think for Dino too, the other drummer, and we'd never played like that, and it's a lot, it's a lot different. So uh, it, just having Jeff join the band added a lot of freshness and gave us a real good kickstart, you know, a kick in the ass to, to make it, fresh again not that it was completely stale and then delving into the 60s took that to another level because now we've got this fresh approach and we've got a new band member and and that's kind of rejuvenated us and now we're going to take on something we've never taken on before so that really took it to another level of practicing and studying and working again uh, so it's been really good for us it really has i had the exact opposite problem <laughs> I came on board. Now I had I had played with Jeff Manson for 11 years in the Zen Tricksters, and uh, our whole focus was on the older psychedelic stuff, and that's kind of the stuff that I listened to as a kid. You know, when I joined Dark Star, I I hardly ever I didn't go to that many 80s shows and 90s shows, a handful, and I never listened to it. So all of a sudden they're like going, you know, you're going to have to do some of this Brent stuff, and I'm like, <laughs> so I started listening and. And I was really pleasantly surprised to find that I really loved his plan, you know, his That's whole his whole thing. I never appreciated him when he was alive, uh, ex except the last time I saw him play, which was in 1990. And he kind of blew me away. But his voice was just ridiculous. So I was like, how the hell am I going to sing like that? You're not. So, and I'm not going to, but, is. but I worked it to the point where I feel comfortable with it now, and it's made me a much better singer. And, I, you know, it's a whole different approach to playing, too. So I had a I had a really bone up on all that stuff, and it took me a little while. But when Jeff came on board, I knew what we were in store for because the, the difference the difference in the band was that we could jam before, but we weren't taking it to these other places that I knew we could go. And as soon as Jeff stepped on board, it was like, oh, here we go, <laughs> and that's what we've been doing, and we're still evolving with that. You know, we're going to places that we've never been before. You know, even we're even taking liberties to go places probably the dead didn't go. But it's so within the that style that it works, you know. Okay. Now I didn't want to ask you about the whole uh, taking the music and exploring and everything. Obviously that ties into what happened on your last West Coast run at the Fillmore with Phil <laughs> jumping in there. Um, now, Rob, I know I talked to you and you explained through your involvement with the Q and reuniting and everything and talking to Phil, that's basically what got the footwork going, but yeah. how was the experience for you guys being on stage with him? Yeah, because Rob obviously has a couple hundred shows. Um, first and foremost, like it was, anytime we had a member of the Grateful Dead come out for the very first time, the first time Bobby played, Billy, Don, anybody, there's, there's a, a surrealism there, you know, it's very surreal to go, wow, all of a sudden, look who we're playing with. Getting past that very quickly because he was so nice and so gracious backstage. Um, it was, uh, from a drummer's standpoint, it was pretty much Nirvana. I mean, it was, and this is not anything against my bandmate, Kevin, but it was just so easy. 
You know, Dino and I were able to lock in so easy because it was Phil. You know, his time is impeccable. He knows exactly where he's going to be, even if he's not playing right on the beat, because he jumps all around it. He hardly ever plays on the beat. But his time was perfect. So it just made it very easy for Dino and I to play. And at first, you know, there's a little apprehension, you know, we got to do this justice. And, you know, all of a sudden, he's going to be listening to the drummers probably more than anybody. And we better be good. And, you know, so there's, <laughs> there's a little bit of nerves there when we first start. You know, we didn't get a sound check with him or anything. We met him five minutes before we went on stage. And halfway through the first song, I get the little turn and the smile and the nod. Yeah. I'm like, he's digging it. You know, the, okay, he's digging it. Everything's good. Now we can relax a little bit more. And it just, it, it, it was really easy. I don't know how else to put it. That's how it seemed to me too, you know. Uh, and I, like you said, I played hundreds of shows with him, and it was the first time I played a show with him where he was just a member of the band. And uh, the, the first thing I noticed was how the drums were approaching it, and it really was. I've I've heard these guys now play hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of shows together, but I never heard them play like this before, you know. And again, not taking anything away from Kevin, but Phil's just got a. He's got a thing that no one else has. Yeah. And uh, what he said to me, uh, I asked because I asked him, I said, well, "What'd you What'd you think?" And he says, well, "Man, he goes, first of all, you guys picked the perfect set list for me, and uh, it felt like going home." And he goes, "And your drummers really responded well to my prodding." <laughs> and he was testing that us. Was sure. great. I said to Rob after the show. I said to Rob after the show. I go, you know, he's pushing. He was pushing us. He was testing us. Yeah. He like, you know, in one jam was here, Dark Star playing in the band. I think it was Dark Star. You know, it's got that swingy lilt to it. And all of a sudden, he straightened out the pulse and took it to a completely different rhythmic place. And. That, that was testing to see if Dino and I would get there with him. And, they, and we were right there, right and he looks there. back, and he nods. I'm like, yeah, he, he was pushing us, definitely, to see if, how far we could go with him and if we could hang, for lack of a better term. And uh, like Rob said, you know, he was prodding us, and I knew he was. And, and that confirmed it when he said it to Rob, you know, and we responded well. He, he dug it. He hasn't done, uh, I mean, aside from the dead, uh, you know, the, the latter day dead, uh, He's been pretty much a single drummer player. I mean, Phil and Friends never had two drummers. Uh, further had drums right. and percussion yeah. for a little while. Um, so I think it was interesting for him to play with two drummers again. But two drummers who, you know, who complemented each other a lot better than Mickey and Billy did in the, in the, in the later days. You know? I don't know about that. But. Well, <laughs> I, I, think, I think by the 90s and stuff, uh, I, for Phil, anyway, I I, I, I can I, I shouldn't even speak for him, but I think that for him it kind of it just became such old hat, and they weren't doing anything that was surprising him. Playing with two guys, you know, these guys aren't Billy and Mickey; they're they're Rob and Dino. They play the way they play, and I think Phil really got off on it. You know, I could see it I, all night. He kept looking back at them, smiling, yeah, and grooving was, with them. It's a really stuff. cool feeling. You know, I know I can read Phil to a certain degree. You know, so. And from what you guys just said, it sounded like Phil did not want like a blueprint standard run through songs. It's like here I am, make me like yeah, have we went fun. big. Yeah, we went big, and 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 we basically just we did what we all do, and what he does is be in the moment and just react to each other and, and have this incredible conversation going on. And it did. I mean, Jeff and him were, uh, during Morning Dew had this unbelievable thing going on. Yeah, you know, quick funny story about it. We, when he, like I said, he only showed up about five minutes before we played. And uh, we, quick hellos in the dressing room, meet each other, let's have fun. We had a set list built up, and we were going to do two or three songs, and then have him come out and join us, you know, so Kevin could start. And he looks at the set list and goes, hmm, you know, no, I think I'd like to play the whole thing. Ha! <laughs> We're like, all right, I'm sure. Come on, Kevin, and you're so, you're okay. He was he was excited to be there. He saw the set list. He really dug what we had picked, and he had a blast, you know. And I hopefully we'll do it again soon. He wants to. He said he did. Um, the other thing that was really cool was watching Kevin. Yeah. Kevin was sitting on the steps, about four feet from Phil's rig, and he just had this look of euphoria. It's like, like a kid in a candy shop. And so afterwards, uh, he comes up to me because. Talk to you for a second. I was like, yeah. He goes, he's a genius. <laughs> I was like, yeah, no. And, and then Kevin came out and played the second set with a fire lit under his ass. And, and ever since ever then, since. and ever since then, this tour, 
he's he's just been he's been wailing, and yeah. I th I think he got he got a really valuable lesson. Yeah, without a doubt. And he yeah. didn't tell you that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, you know, it's it it really is interesting. You listen to one of your heroes on recording forever and ever and ever, but when you like like for me going to see Chick Corea uh, a year ago uh, at the Blue Note in New York City. I was sitting right behind him. I had the most perfect view of him playing. It blew my mind to see him do what he does. You know, it's a whole different experience. Yeah. You know, or to probably for you to watch it like a great drummer that maybe you've yeah, never you seen. Yeah, you mentioned Chick at the at the Blue Note. I got to do that with Steve Gadd at the Vanguard. Yeah. And wow. you know, we sat about this far away. And he's one of my heroes my whole right. life. And it doesn't get any better than that. That was actually. Wait a minute. Was that with Chick? The thing with him and and Coltrane's kid, Ravi Coltrane. Yeah. Yeah. And, was that the Blue Note? It might have been. It wasn't. What, what show did you see, Chick? No, I saw Return to for Acoustic Return to Forever. Okay, this was with and with Frank Gambale on on yeah, uh, yeah on guitar guitar this, yeah. and and Gad and it was wow, wow. yeah it was pretty cool cool beans and then like you said though when I got to watch Steve Gad that way. Seen him on videotape, seen him from the back of a crowd, but until you can actually like, you can see the knuckles on his fingers. It's it's a whole different ball game when you get to see someone yeah. that close. A whole new appreciation and understanding of what they're doing, and that's what Kevin got that night. Yeah, he got it in a big way, you know. Like we're uh, we're playing playing in the band, and uh, Kevin said to me, he goes, "Man, he was doing these figures that I don't know how he came up with it, but it worked so perfectly. But I've never have thought to play it that way." And now he's got a whole, you know, he has a whole other approach to it. So, pretty cool. Yeah, now of course, playing with Phil and everything, I want to ask, um, I don't know, for you guys, how much of, yeah, how much of your show is like a, a labor of love, or does it ever feel like you're just going through the motions? I mean, almost never through yeah. the, going through the motions. We, we love what we do, and uh, we have a lot of passion for it. I mean, we have challenges, certain rooms will play, it's just so hard to yeah. You know, this music, you have got to hear every nuance. Uh, the other night we played at a place um, in Northampton, Massachusetts, and that stage was the most perfect sounding wow. stage. We could hear a pin drop, and when you can hear that way, you can have the conversation you need to have to have this to play this kind of music. Uh, Penn's Peak is another place like that. This is a great sounding room. Now you know, other rooms. Last night? Not Last so night. Not so good. <laughs> Still fun, though. Fun, but it's a more of a struggle. You have to really dig in. You have to close your eyes and really dig in to, 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 he, to hear it all. You and, know? and then there's the physical thing. You know, we could be on the fourth or fifth night in a row, and it's a Sunday after playing Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and you can't wait for the day off, and you're just exhausted. And you're, two guys are sick, and another guy is cranky, you know, but... <laughs> You know, and the day just, the day sucks. But you still don't end up going through the motions because when you get on stage, hey, here's a good four hours in this really, really hard day. Oh, as so, soon as the music starts and it starts to play you, it's you, it doesn't matter, nothing matters. So I don't, I literally, I don't think we go through the motions for a minute. Yeah. Not one minute a day, on, or on stage anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, we might go through the motions at sound check. <laughs> yeah. yeah. But it's trying to get it done, but honestly, we all love the music so much, and re regardless of the Grateful Dead music, we all just love to play. It doesn't matter what it is. You know, I'll play anything and be happy. So I don't think we're ever really going through the motions. Hey, I just sang Highway to Hell with Phil. <laughs> I mean, you know, the, wow. the, whole, the whole thought of it was, like, scary. And then we did it. I had a blast. I did a gig last week at home where I had to play What I Like About You by The Romantics. <laughs> Not once, but twice. I was in a gig. <laughs> You know, but I still had a blast. I got to play drums. You know? Of course, of course. I used to do weddings for a living. So uh, did I. <laughs> in another lifetime. Yeah. And I did about 500 of them in my life. And uh, the band, the band leader, who was a friend of mine, used to turn around and look at me. and goes, "Why are you smiling? I'm playing music. Said, I'm playing. You know. I, yeah. All right. I, 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 I get it. I'm playing shout for the thousandth time. But. <laughs> yeah. All right, dinner set's over. Stand by me. One. Oh, God. <laughs> I, I probably did. Not quite as many as him, but I did uh, wedding gigs for like eight years. But when you're playing, you're transported to this, this other place, you know? And uh, it's easy for me to block it all, all the rest of it out, you know? So, 
Cool. And obviously, you guys are still involved in side projects, I'd imagine, like a little bit here and there. Yeah. Uh, Pretty much everybody plays with somebody when they're on break. You know, I think everybody has a gig here and there. You know, some guys more regularly than others. Um, some guys doing dead, Grateful Dead type stuff on the side. Some of us not doing Grateful Dead type stuff or anything but Grateful Dead type stuff on the side. But everybody plays. Yeah, I've been uh, fortunate this this year. I've, I've I've been able to go and play with Phil again a bunch, so that's cool. And uh, Jeff Manson and I have a have a project of uh, Manson, Baracko, and friends. And uh, we we've, we've done a bunch of electric gigs, and then we also do an, uh, an acoustic duo. I play bass in it. Okay. And he plays acoustic guitar. Uh, we don't get to do it that often, but we do it. It's, it's really cool, you know, and we don't we don't just do dead. I mean, we do a couple of tunes, but we con we concentrate on we, we have like a at one point in in that history, which goes back a ways now. We've probably got like 500 songs. Yeah. You know? Now, for any of those, um, like you know, you and Jeff and friends, is there any uh, talk with Tommy and Cliff at all of getting involved? Or I don't mean to bring up anything from the past. Oh no, 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 that's that's fine. You know, Cliff and I know each other since very, I, since I'm eight years old. He grew up in the same town as me. He was my hero for like through high school and stuff. I, right, everybody wanted thing. everybody <laughs> wanted to be Cliff, you know, <laughs> back in those days because he was he was like the town hippie cool guy, you know. He's the first guy I ever saw that had long hair, you know. Anyway, yeah. I digress. <laughs> uh, but yeah, they, um, actually, um, have you ever heard of the Wetlands? Yeah. Okay, so. Well, it's closed in what 2000. Oh, I think it was 2001 or two. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the original owner, Larry Block, just passed away two weeks ago. Yeah, is that right? Uh, yeah, pancreatic cancer. And uh, there's talk. Uh, Peter Shapiro, who was the other owner, the after, mm -hmm. uh, who now owns the Brooklyn Bowl and Capital. the Capitol Theater, uh, is wants to put together a uh, a memorial for him. He wants to do a wetlands type thing with an eco saloon and all this stuff. And uh, Moe's manager, Topper, came to see us up in Toronto this past week. And he talked to Jeff and I about putting the Tricksters back together. They, they were like the number one on their list because we were, I, I think we played wetlands more than any other band. You did, according to the website. Yeah. 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 <laughs> and uh, so they really want us to do what, you know, go back and do what we did. And yeah, hey, are you kidding? For Larry? Sure. But regardless of all that, I mean, just from an outsider, they're all buddies. Oh, yeah. yeah there's nothing. There's, I mean, we see Cliff yeah, with his all awesome band called Rumor Has It that he yeah. has, where he plays guitar. Yeah. And we see them at festivals, and Tommy's playing with them and all that. Everybody's friends. Yeah. And I don't think there's any hard I feelings to, anywhere. No, no. I, I, I don't get to see those guys that often because, our, you know, everybody's schedules are so insane. But you know, I love those guys, you know. They're, they're my family. Yeah. So. And you know, talking about people like that, that's all like mostly people that in Wilkes-Barre Scranton area know from the Tricksters days and now Jam Stampede and you guys, of course. I want to say like, like you know, with Dark Star, has there been any like major memories of this Northeast PA region over the last like 10 years? I know you guys had Steve Kimmock sitting with you for the first time back in 04 at the Staircase yeah. in Pittston. You know, <laughs> I, I have a memory, I mean I have lots of them. Okay. And then I have lots that I've forgotten too. But what just popped into my head, which is really strange, maybe it's because I'm sitting next to you, was one of my East Coast memories is we played a gig, this is not too soon after Scott died, and we played at the Electric Factory in Philadelphia. I think we did 5877. That's exactly what we did. And that was my first run. And, like we, my yeah, show. and we nailed it. We nailed it. You know, Rob, Rob's played maybe five or six shows with us at that point. And we came off stage and he goes, Wow, that was great. I get what you're doing. This is amazing. You know, I feel like that was the night that we hooked Rob in and he said, boy, this is something I could do. Yeah, you know, it's and true. And, and the thing is, is because 5-8 is such a, you know, iconic show, I mean, I was there. I saw right. that show and I've listened to it so many times. It's so brilliant. And we went on stage and just immersed ourselves in the moment and pulled, pulled it off. We didn't, we didn't do it exactly like they did it, but we had, we had the sound of it. Down, it really blew my mind that these guys could pull that off. I had never played with anybody else that could do that, and a lot of it had to do with the nuances of the way they got the instruments to sound, and 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 sticking within the the arrangements of the songs. I mean, yeah, I played all these songs a million times with Manson, but we never we never paid any attention to any of that stuff. We just played it the way we played it. 
Right. You know, going back to what he was saying before, when I when I joined the band, I, I had just come off of you know playing with Phil and the Q and all that stuff, and my playing was really frenetic and crazy. You know, and I think I think they were like looking at me, going, "Dude, what are you doing?" I remember one specific night at the 9:30 Club in Washington D.C. We're doing Scarlet Begonias, and there's this little tiny break before it goes to the jam, mm -hmm. and it's just it's a keyboard break. And I started playing this ridiculous, stupid salsa montuno. And I screwed these guys up. And I got off stage, and the two of them like, what the hell were you thinking? And I was like, I know, I know, I'm really sorry, man. But it taught me a really valuable lesson. That, you know, you, when you're playing with other people, you have to fit in. You can't just be a madman and do what you want to do. It's a collective. Um, and, it, and I learned a very valuable lesson, and I, and I really started to do my homework, and it really changed me as a player. I remember one of the hardest things I had to do, and you'll probably remember this too. <coughs> Excuse me. This was still early on in Rob's tenure, but we were, had another guy we were looking at also. And oh, he yeah, did a tour, yeah. He did a tour, and we were trying to decide you know, who we were going to hire full time and all that. And you know, I, I didn't know Rob that well yet. You know, and he, he was a guy who was helping us out at that point, right? Yeah. You know, and I had to go, it was in Charlottesville, Virginia, Star Hill. Mm -hmm. We had a meeting about it without Rob in the room and trying to decide what to do. And we were split on whether Rob was going to be, I'm, I'm putting you out there, do you mind? No, okay. I'm okay. <laughs> it's okay we, were, we were split on whether we wanted Rob to be a full time keyboard player or keep looking at guys and other guys. And I, I had a problem with Rob's playing. And, I had to go up to him and say something about it, you know, and it was hard for me because I had but to be. You were, but you were very complimentary. I had to be an adult though and say, you know, I think you're an amazing player. You're the best keyboard player I've ever played with. But for what we're doing and what we're trying to do, you play way too many notes. And that's exactly <laughs> how I said it. I said, you play too much. And he was, and I knew he was right. And now he goes back and listens to those tapes. Oh, I and goes, oh my God! I can't listen to them. I can't believe how much I was playing. Yeah. Yeah, so all that was part of the development and growth, not only of us as a band, but as of me as a person and Rob as a musician. And and it has translated because when I went out to play with the Q for the first time in April, uh, Robbie Taylor, who is Phil's stage manager, came up to me uh, after the first rehearsal and he says, can I talk to you for a second? I was like, sure. Did he tell you to play more? No. He said, he goes, is it my imagination or has your playing changed? I was like, well, I'm, yeah, it's been nine years. <laughs> Hope it's changed a little bit anyway. And I, I said, I know what I know what you're I know what you're getting at though. I said, you you're hearing that I'm playing less, listening more. He goes, that's exactly right. And uh, he says, you sound great. Hmm. And and I was really pleased that he noticed that. That's awesome. And, and I had a lot more respect for him that he actually he does pay attention, you know. I, you I had to know that story. That's great. Yeah, so uh, it made me feel good because... So my talk worked. <laughs> of course it did. I mean, I wanted... And, and besides that, I really wanted the gig. You know, I really loved playing with these guys. And, and, and you know, what, a, what, what better way to make a living than doing what you have passion for and playing with guys that you really get along with? So, yeah, I wanted the gig. So, sure, I'll change the way I play. Why not? You know, I, musical growth is so important. I, I never want to stop growing. And hopefully if you listen to the band now and you listen to any of the musicians in the band in 99, whenever they joined, I, mean, I hope I play differently than I did in 99. Yeah. I hope I'm not just the same stale, stagnant player I was then. You know, I hope it's changed. I have to have a talk with you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, the key is listening more, you know. In a band like this, especially with two drummers, and with so much music going on, your ears have to be huge. Your yeah. ears got to be open and hearing everything that's why when I put my eyes closed most of the time if my eyes are closed my ears are open more I don't yeah, know why no it's true but if I have my eyes closed I'm able to focus on that take that sense out of the picture no pun intended and then this sense becomes bigger and you, I mean that's the key to doing what we do especially with two drummers is being able to hear every note at the same time and think and not think and react all in milliseconds don't think don't think <laughs> <laughs> all right well, guys, uh, Les, I just wanted to ask, you know, what's in store for the band? Do you guys have anything big you're working on over the next couple months? Yeah, we got some really exciting yeah, things going do. on. Anything um, you speak about? Or? Yeah, sure. <laughs> oh, I already mentioned, I might, I might not have, I might have been off, out of bounds mentioning the Jubilee. We're tentatively scheduled to do it Memorial Day weekend. That's not a done deal yet. Um, but we're working on having our second Jubilee. 
Um, some of the same acts, some different acts. Uh, all friends of ours like we've done and then we have this really exciting thing going on in march um the jam in the sand jam in the sand four nights on the beach in um in the grill jamaica uh with keller williams uh three three electric shows we're gonna do and one acoustic show and um it's like an all-exclusive like ridiculous resort and uh, other 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 bands have, have done it there i think government mule and Red little, dog. little feet Street rat trees. dog so we're, we're really excited about you know, that. The music doesn't start till 6 o'clock every night. So during the day, it's just a chill, all-inclusive resort, enjoy a beach vacation. We're going to have activities that the bands are sponsoring. Yeah, I'm hosting a golf tournament. And I'm hosting a Go to the Falls tour thing with Lisa. Keller's doing a water ski thing, water ski with Keller. Nice. And then, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and then it, uh, at 6 o'clock every night, uh, one night we'll start acoustic and Keller will play after us. The other three nights, Keller will do his set. And we'll play a full electric after him. And I'm sure there'll be some cross pollination between the, you know, the two of us. So that yeah. should be really cool. Cool. Well, I'm sure we all look forward to that. Hopefully, some of us make it down there. I hope so. There's, There's still rooms time. available. Not many though, so jump on it quick. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost done. All right, guys. Well, you know, Rob and Rob, thank you again for the time. Yeah. Our pleasure. Thank yeah, you. Definitely pleasure, a great time. And I think right now we're going to go have a party out in Penn Speak, huh? Yeah, we are. It's going to be fun. Like yep. we do every year. So thank you again, guys. And right. we'll talk to you soon. Happy Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. You too, guys.